Hi, everyone. Um, this is uh, an, a great and special occasion because I have the, the honor and, uh, and the pleasure to interview one of the most influential people and what for me is my inspiration since, since uh, first I found his blog in 2007, 2007, the first blog I ever read, Seth Gooding. Um, Thank Seth, you. thanks for, for being in uh, Disrupt Everything podcast series and Disrupt Everything interviews for Disruptors. It's a pleasure. We'll make a ruckus. Well, Seth Gooding um, is an author of 1919 books that have been bestsellers all around the world and have been translated into more than 35 languages. He's also the founder of the Alt MBA and the Marketing Seminar. This only online workshops that has been transformed the work of thousands of people, including me. Seth writes about the post-industrial revolution, the way ideas spread, marketing, quitting, leadership, and most of all, changing, cha changing and challenging everything. You might be familiar with his books, also in Spanish, like Lynchpin, Tribes, and The Deep. Also, Pop the Box and The Icarus Deception. Permission marketing changed direct marketing forever. And Purple Co. is considered one of the most influential marketing books of its time. Now, this is marketing. Again, challenges the way we've been doing marketing and set up a new standard based on learning to see empathy positive change, and making a difference for the sake of humanity, not for performance or clickbait. Seth, Seth sorry, has okay. given, <laughs> Seth has given thousands of speeches to millions of people. In addition um, to, to his writing and speaking, Seth has founded several companies, including uh, Jojo Dine and Squido. His blog, which you can find by typing Seth uh, into Google and it will appear the first one, is one of, of the most popular blogs in the world, which I'm, I'm subscribed since 2007, being the first blog I read in the internet and the second I subscribe it to. Since then, I receive every day uh, a post, or sometimes two or three uh, and even four. Um, and I, I have said all these posts classified by categories in my email is the uh, wow that's fantastic because i never bothered to categorize them so i'm glad you did that for me thank you <laughs> and seth lately launched uh two new books first what to do when is your turn which is now uh, uh, i think is in, in it's seven printing i presume yeah. and this is marketing which i mentioned before seth um i, I I could go and go and go. Because that, was way, that was way too long. Very well. kind. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for making some time for this interview. Uh, I hope you, were, you bear with me my sometimes rusty Spanglish. Uh, Your English is great. Way better than my <laughs> Spanish. What do, you want to talk, what do you want to talk about, Isra? For, for, for a dyslexic pe person, it was hard enough to, to learn Spanish. Can you imagine English? Yeah, yeah, it was a beautiful struggle. So jokes apart, it's a real honor. honor. <laughs> So my, my first question, uh, I just, I was, I've been like two months writing questions, deleting, putting new ones, you know, modifying. So my first question is, Seth, what are the highlights, the, the big moments in your life since you were in school up until now? That's an interesting place to start. I would say, when I tell stories to people about the highlights, they are almost always stories of failure. Things that I did for the right reason, where I thought I put in the right effort and it failed uh, catastrophically, catastrophically. That uh, things that went sideways in ways that I didn't expect. Projects that didn't find traction. Because it's in those moments that you understand how valuable the things that work are. And it's also in those moments that you learn the most because you discover how other people are in the world much more clearly when it doesn't work. And could you name a, a few, a few experiences? An example or two. Well, if you see behind me, there are many books. Uh, I frequently talk about the 800 rejection letters I got in making those books, 800 in a row without selling one thing. Or... Uh, 
the time that my publisher at Simon & Schuster fired me because they said they didn't want to publish my books anymore because they wouldn't sell. (laughs) Or um, the sales calls that I went on. The time I went on a sales call to Levi's in San Francisco, I flew across the country. It was a very hard meeting to get. I'm in the meeting with the guy. And I was going right as I was in the middle of switching from one laptop to the other. So I had both of them with me. And while I'm giving my presentation, my laptop starts on fire and smoke starts coming out the top. <laughs> and it was great. I didn't even miss a beat. I just shut the lid, dropped it in the trash can, pulled out my other laptop and continued. And like, how many chances do you get to do something like that? And we never sold anything to Levi Strauss. But it was you know, <laughs> discovering one more way that the world is going to make it so that it doesn't go according to plan. It's interesting because you, a lot of people has answered this question with their big moments, their successes. But the, 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 the way you are wired is, is the other way around. I mean, you start for, you know, the failures because I saw your, your talk on the mark, uh, market, mar- direct marketing hall of fame inductee. And you start with failing, fail, fail, fail fail, fail. At at the end, you say, this is marketing. This having guts to learn what, what it might not work. Right. Exactly. And, and the, the, I don't think I'm wired that way. I think I chose that wiring and the way I, the reason is because it takes all the power away from failure, right? That if you are afraid of failure, then you'll be afraid to go forward. But if you're looking forward to failure, then what's holding you back? Nothing. This is what I realized in, for example, in the marketing seminar. I've taken the marketing seminar. Uh, as I said, and as I recommended, the most powerful marketing course I ever taken beyond any master, book, teaching. How and why did you build it? Well, I built it for people like you because I would like to be able to spend the time to teach you one-on-one, but I can't. And what I found was a book goes part of the way, but what people really need is to engage with the others, to try out their own work, to see and be seen. And there are enough people in my life who have a vision they want to bring forward, who have a difference they want to make, and they were getting stuck. And so if I can contribute to your journey, that felt like a good way to spend a year of my life. And what have you learned after now is the six editions, if I, if I recall right. properly. What, what, what are the highlights or what do you say? Like, yeah, we, we've learned a lot. Um, I can imagine. One thing, one thing we learned is the parts that I thought people would get stuck on, they have no trouble with. And the parts that I thought were obvious get a lot of people stuck. That was really, because when you write books, you don't know this because you don't get to see people reading your book. So we've gone through and improved a lot of the videos and the lessons because we say, oh, this is a spot where people get stuck. Let's, you know, add some more resource here. Um, I learned that our students are way more generous than I hoped, that they are eager to help each other. And I guess the third thing I learned is that all of us are afraid. And then when it gets time to get to our truth, we will hide as hard as we are capable of hiding. It, 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 it leads me to the next question, and uh, what, what differs this is marketing from the marketing seminar? Because we're talking about all well, first I, I built the marketing seminar first, and then when I saw how people were using it, I thought, wow, there's a whole bunch of people who won't take this course. Maybe I should make a book for them. So the book is actually the bookization of the course, not the other way around. And so the book works on a lot of levels, but there's no way it's close to as effective as the courses. So it's like the, the previous thing before you enter in the course. It's like, yeah, I think if you can get your hands on the book and then take the course, that's the perfect combination. A great foundation. Yeah. And Seth, um, a, a question that a lot of people is asking themselves because you say it in one post, I remember we all do marketing. Everybody's right. a marketer, yeah? All so, the time. <laughs> I want to do marketing that matters. Well, where should I start with? So start with the people you want to change. 
Start with what those people believe, what they dream of, what they fear, and then bring them what they need to get to where they want to go. That's it. Don't do it the opposite way. Don't say, I really want to be a baker or chocolate maker. No, who's it for and what's it for? If you begin there, everything gets easier. I assume that's, that's educating people. No, it's educating yourself, right? It's developing the empathy. If you bring a thirsty person in a glass of water, it's not that hard to sell them a glass of water. But if you bring somebody who just drank a six pack of beer, a glass of water, they're going to tell you to go away. So serve people who are needing you, who are waiting for you, who are trusting you. Begin there. And as for education, now that almost everyone can start an education program or its own you know, initiative or challenge, what would you say to those, to those who, who want to create a positive impact through education? Because we all, uh, maybe the answer is what you said, educate yourself first. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people who are starting online courses because they think it's easy and they think it's profitable. And it's neither one. It's easy to make a bunch of videos and put them on the internet. Um, and for a while, some people will be able to sell those for a profit. But the best way to educate is to do it one person at a time. And only after you're good at it, figure out how to bring that pedagogy to the world in a more digital way. But most of the digital courses I see online are worthless. I still remember the post you write about you want to do marketing, start with 20 people. Then yeah. when you impact these 20 people, another 20. And this 20 will lead to 100. And then 100. Exactly. Yeah. There are all these people who want to start by being on the Super Bowl. And the thing is, or the World Cup, you're not going to be on the World Cup. So don't start there. Start with the smallest viable audience. And it leads me to Elt MBA. My, this is my next challenge for, for 2028, I guess. is. is I, I must, I must, just, I must say that the marketing seminar is not easy. It's tough. So I, I, I was talking with Natalia, one of the coaches, and she told me that Alt MBA is, uh, is a big deal. So is yeah. it possible that this project was born after hosting the six months MBA you created some years ago? You remember? I, I, well, you had. So what what happened with the with the former, and what can we learn in the first? Because I okay. follow this experiment really closely. Well, that's great. Thank you. Uh, 10 years ago. That was 10 I had, years ago? Whoa. Yeah. I had nine people come to my office for six months. We sat together every day for six months. And it changed them and it changed me. Uh, one of those people still works for me. And um, she didn't work for me in between, but she just joined the team again. Uh, that was magnificent, and it led to my book, Lynchpin. The, at the end of it, I knew I couldn't do it again. It was too hard. But I also knew that there was a real thirst for people to be part of something. And so five years after that, we built the Alt-MBA, which doesn't have a lot in common with the six-month MBA that I did, um, except that it shares my goal of helping people get to where they're going and do it by being seen. And, and being seen is one of the, one of the ways of doing the, the work that, that matters, that you talk a lot. And so how, how does it look, how, how, do, how does it look like doing the work that matters? And, and can, you, can you explain like a, no a, a shortcut, but like where, where should we start doing the work that matters? Okay, so work that matters is pretty simple is would we miss you if you were gone, right? That if you are the hundredth company that makes snow shovels, we wouldn't miss you if you were gone because we'll just buy somebody else's. On the other hand, if you are seeing us, understanding us, part of us, if you are doing something unique and special uh, that's different for a good reason, then that matters because we need you or our life would be less without you. So you are becoming indispensable, like linchpin. You, a linchpin. Now, indispensable is a tricky word because no one is actually indispensable. But in the short run, you feel indispensable. And then the second half of it is it scares you. And if it doesn't scare you, 
you're not doing something that's dangerous enough. You're not doing something that's important enough. And so when we combine those two, to be missed when you're gone and to do work that scares you because it is so generous and so uh, present, then you're onto something. And that's what it is to be alive. I'm super intrigued by how has evolved the linchpin from 2014 to now, to 2019. How do you think has evolved? It's been, it's been happening quite a lot of things. Well, you know, when I wrote it, the, um, the industrial complex was way stronger than it was now. There was no WeWork. There was Facebook had just finally, I mean, it's not even mentioned in the book. It had just shown up. Um, and so we're now seeing more and more people who are a team of one, more and more people who are independent. And if you're independent, you can't coast because we can replace you just by clicking a different click. So no one argues with me anymore that we need linchpins. They used to. Now the question is, yes, but how do I do it? And the big misconception is that you should do it by having a lot of Instagram followers and you should do it by <laughs> being a big name in, in social media. And I think that's nonsense. And so if that is nonsense, um, what would you say is, if you, have a, if you um, ever have to mention the best skill that first makes you uh, what you are and can make another people to stand out, what skill right. would you choose? To be a human. And what is to be human, actually? Today. To do the opposite of being a factory or a computer or an AI, to not say, I just do my job, to not simply follow the rules, to not ask for shortcuts, to not use bullet points and step-by-step -step instructions, to not treat everyone like they're just another person in line. And when we act like a human, fully present and treat different people differently, then we have a chance to become a linchpin. Ah. And Seth, um yeah, I've been, you know, listening uh, all the interviews in, with Tim Ferriss, about, you know, become the brand, a, a lot of uh, in the marketing, in involved marketing. But it's one question I've never uh, seen somebody asking you. And what's the toughest thing you have you had to endure in your life, and how do how did you overcome it? If you had, well, there's point, almost if I. And, the, the that's a great question. There's almost nothing that's tough about my life. When I see people who were born in poverty, when I see people who haven't been given the support that I've been given, when I think about the fact that I'm mostly healthy almost all the time, uh, I can't complain about anything being tough. That's, I just don't deserve that word. Uh, I think that in terms of overcoming things in serving the mission that I'm on, the hardest thing is reminding myself that I'm not a total failure, reminding myself that this could work because the world doesn't organize itself to keep you motivated. You have to keep yourself motivated. motivated. And so there are lots of days when I didn't have the support I would have hoped for lots of days when the ball didn't bounce the way I wanted it to. And it's on those days that you feel like giving up, and it's on those days you need to rem remember that self-motivation is the most important kind of motivation. And it's also a great skill. And, and Seth, what are the things, because I believe, uh, um, and also Tim first mentions, uh, you, you are genius in the way you, you make stories and the way you think and make other people think and change marketing, not by the marketing of itself, but the change you create. So what are the things that we don't see about you that you know that sets you apart and we need to see because it will add comprehension to who you are. Yeah, there's nothing you people need to know about me. You know, people should not <laughs> do anything because I said it was a good idea. This is, the difference between uh, a cultural leader and a scientific leader is it doesn't matter if Einstein or Maxwell or Madame Curie said something. It's either true or it's not. It either works for you or it doesn't, right? That's different than saying Leonard Bernstein conducted it this way. Well, that's his taste. That's not science, it's taste. 
and I'm not a scientist, but no one should take any of my advice if it doesn't work for them. And who I am and what I have for breakfast and what people want to know about me is irrelevant. And that's why I'm not that interested in sharing it because I'm not hoping that the world will turn into a big mirror that I can look at myself in. I am hoping that if I notice something and point it out to people and they notice it too, then they can use it to help themselves achieve their goals. But I'm not telling anybody what to do just because it's me. Great, great answer. Thank you. And what that, what that, following that question, what are your biggest weaknesses and how you, how you make them, strength them and what are your strengths and how you empower them? I would say my biggest weaknesses are I'm impatient about uh, the way ideas are exchanged. Uh, I jump ahead a lot. Uh, I eat too much dark chocolate for sure. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, Just eat that table now. And, and um. I think that uh, it would be better if I was uh, more empathic and tolerant of people who are overcoming more brainwashing than I had. And I'm aware that I was brainwashed, but I can only imagine how much more some other people were brainwashed. And now they're brainwashed. Yeah, we are. And Seth, um, and I knew that uh, Thick Tigler was your kind of mentor. This, he just, uh, you learn a lot about, about uh, with him. What's the most important lesson you learn uh, from your mentor or your, your friends? Oh, there's a whole bunch of things. I would say um, the biggest Zig lesson is that positive thinking is a choice and positive thinking doesn't guarantee you'll be able to do anything, but it does guarantee you'll be able to do something better than negative thinking will. And if we can um, focus on um, feeding ourselves positive, optimistic possibility on a regular basis, it will help us get through the parts when the universe feeds us negative thinking. And it also has to be with the men mental, on a, also an emotional level and physical and a spiritual level too. Yeah, and I think that's different for different people about how you feed yourself this. But, you know, uh, Roz and Ben Zander, their book, The Art of Possibility is magnificent. <coughs> I, I listen to that book two or three times a year. I put it in there. And, you know, Right, and that just hearing it over and over again, reminding yourself, the only person who can give you an A is you. Give yourself an A and then make it come true. Um, that's a big idea, and too many people don't do that. And, and Seth, um, I'm working since 2013, since I started like looking at people like that play at different level, uh, like you, like Tim, like Gary Barnett, uh, Mel Robbins, a, lot, a bunch of people, Richard Branson. So, and I, I called like high performance for everyone, which is being uh, working on the, the four body dimension, the four human being dimensions, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. So how Seth Godin tries to stay in shape mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Yeah, I think that I might not be the best person to ask that question to because I'm focused more on this group I seek to serve. What do they need and how can I help them? Right. And uh, because I've been so fortunate and because I'm not out there, you know, like when I was pioneering the internet, there were a lot of meetings that didn't go well. I was trying very hard to change organizations that didn't want to be changed. And now I've shifted to being a teacher of people who want to go somewhere. And if someone doesn't want to go there, I don't worry about it one bit. If they do want to go there, then it's my job to help them get there. And so the kind of work I have to do is different. And so I'm looking deeper into the nuance of the pedagogy and how to have the right empathy for the people we seek to serve. It's not the same as when you're out there trying to sell a million dollar online promotion in 1995. That was a much more uh, 
catastrophic rough and tumble sort of change I was trying to make. And, and then what would be your advice for folks that are starting in, in marketing or in the internet right now in this 2019 and, and what will yeah, be, I think you, again, back to the thirsty person, find thirsty people. Don't spend your time trying to change people who don't want to be changed. And how about the traditional marketer that one start, that one that started in 2000? Well, you're only a traditional marketer as long as you want to be a traditional marketer. And as soon as it stops serving you, you should stop doing it. I have no time or patience to help uh, Procter and Gamble sell more soap. Right? We don't have a soap marketing problem anymore. We don't need a giant soap marketing company. And if you work at a giant soap marketing company and you need your soap sales to go up, I don't think I can help you. And if you cannot help, what they, why they need to look for? They need to leave and go sell something they're proud of to people who want to be sold to. And Seth, in, you are really prominent on speaking engagement. You are more of the soft uh, uh, speaker in all over the world. And, I saw a lot of uh, speaking engagements. I see like, the way you, you're treating the audience, connecting with really professional. What will be, and, and really serious, and, and, and making the jokes with the no laughing. I mean, I've been following these steps really closely. And what has been your most powerful advice on a speaking engagement? One, you are in the stage, another one for preparation, and then for getting better gigs. Okay, well, So we're going far afield and I'm going to have to start wrapping this up soon. But I would say uh, memorizing your speech doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. A memorized speech sounds like you're reading me a memo and I could read the memo faster than you could read it to me. So don't waste everybody's time. Just send me the memo and go home. And there's nothing wrong with memos. They're way more efficient than speeches. So if that's not why you're on stage, why are you on stage? You're on stage to change somebody in the audience. You do that not with data, but with the exchange of emotion. That when you bring confidence and personality to the message you are sending, that is what is being received, not the words. So it's okay that some of the slides that I use in my deck, I've been using for a really long time. Because the slide isn't the point. The point is, what does it mean to be in the room when someone cares about what they're saying to you? And um, in terms of how to get better at this, I wrote a book 20 years ago called uh, Really Bad PowerPoint. It's very short. You can find it online for free. It's more of an essay than a book. And in it, I say you should not use your PowerPoint as a teleprompter. If you need a teleprompter, use a teleprompter, but don't put them on the screen for everyone to read along. And you should tell me a story. And if you know how to tell a story to two people, you know how to tell a story to two million people. Tell better stories, tell true stories, tell stories that resonate with us. If you can tell us a story, then as human beings, we'll be able to hear your story because that's what human beings do. And you won't have to memorize anything because you don't need to memorize your story. And you'll be more comfortable and you'll be more authentic and it will work better. So that's my advice. So Treasure have, our time, don't waste our time and tell us a story. I have like a really quick uh, answer questions. Uh, so wrapping up. Let's, let's go. What's been your best investment and your worst investment? My best investment was my blog for sure. And my worst investment was um, not buying uh, stock in Google when they went public and keeping uh, my money in my bank account instead. Most of my worst investments are things I didn't do, not things that I did that didn't work. Interesting. If you miss, if you lose everything and you had the chance to keep just one thing, what will it be, Seth? Well, that's such a tricky, clever question. Because like if you... If you get three wishes, you can wish for one more wish and then you'll never <laughs> run out of wishes. Uh, I mean, I don't want to contemplate losing everything, losing my personality and my family and my trust in my, no, I'm, I don't want to answer that question. I have no idea. 
what are your ta- uh, what are your favorite podcast well akimbo.link is my favorite that's the one i spend the most time on um mystery show episode three is a classic uh i love 99 invisible roman mar is a great person uh i listen to brian koppelman on the moment um and dozens and dozens of other podcasts uh hardcore history with dan carlin totally worth listening to all 11 hours on Genghis khan that one has really sat with me um so there's more than that but that's where i'll start krista tippett and what are the book that has fascinated the most and why Uh, the recent book i'm reading is the beginning of infinity and you need to I'm going to suggest you get an audiobook. It's a beautiful reading. And maybe you listen to it three or four times, so you'll begin to understand it. It's very complicated. It's really good. We'll write it down, yeah. And um, who would you recommend me interviewing next, Seth? No idea. <laughs> what would what would like carrying a good life according to Seth Gooding? A good life? Mm-hmm. Make promises and keep them, and then make bigger promises. And Seth, I have the two final questions. The first one is, I have this printed almost six years ago in the wall of my my bedroom. It says, I had no choice. It was the best program I could get into. I had no choice. He told me to do it. Really? It's probably more accurate to to say that the short-term benefit, satisfaction, risk, avoidance was a lot higher than anything else. So I choose to do it what I did. Remarkable work often comes from making choices when everyone else feels as though there is no choice. Difficult choice involves painful sacrifices, advanced planning, and just plain guts. What, what, were, you, what were you thinking when you wrote this? Just that, <laughs> the question in mind for me is the million, the million dollar question. Yeah, I haven't heard that in a long time. Um, I'm guessing that I wrote that after someone said I had no choice and I knew they had a choice. And so I thought, why did they say I had no choice? And that's where it came from. And Seth, finally, what will be the most impactful thing you you can say to everyone who is listening or viewing this interview? Well, I am trying to judge my work by what people like you teach other people. And so I've already had my chance to say my most impactful 7,400 things. Uh, The real question is, what will you teach somebody else with your time? Because that's how ideas spread. Not when we say it, but when the people we impact say something to somebody else. So you should go make a ruckus. And if I've helped even this much, then I'm very proud to say I know you. You do. You did. You helped so much to helping me to make an impact in other, in other people, in other organizations that want to receive and to create this impact. Seth, is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm good. Thank you for doing this. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Muchas gracias. We'll see you soon. Gracias. Thank you, Seth. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.